Schwartzman was talking, uh, Ed and Casey, as the last Republican elected in Bloomington, you can do it. So, uh, uh, it's, it's my distinct privilege today to, uh, to come here as, you know, having the position that I do as serving as a student body president, but also as a conservative, introducing someone who's a conservative icon in our state. Um, I think it's, it's fitting that today, which is um, often referred to as 912, a day when we really talked a lot about uh, you know, the spirit that America brings together. I think it's fitting that we have uh, one of the most patriotic people I've ever met here as our keynote speaker today. So uh, it's, my, it's my pleasure to introduce Richard Murdoch, who serves currently as our state treasurer and is running for the United States Senate uh, in a pretty tough primary. Uh, not tough for him, but tough uh, for both of them because it's going to be pretty competitive. Um, running against an incumbent senator, uh, Richard has been unqualified, the, the biggest supporter of this group uh, we've ever known, and he has been for years, year after year after year. There's every time we need somebody to help us, we need somebody to help us fundraise, come to a call-out meeting, or just come, come meet some of our college Republicans and get them involved, Richard's there. Um, he really cares about this state, he cares about every one of you, and he's really poured a lot into me and to a lot of the other college Republicans here. Uh, so if you would, please join me in welcoming uh, the great state treasurer, and the only state treasurer that has a PhD in his word of it, paleontology. <laughs> Thank you, Justin, for those very, very kind words. Uh, I do love college Republicans, and I always love coming to the IU campus. You know, this is so exciting for me tonight. As many times as I've been here, it's call-out night. As many times as we've met over the student union, I know why you're here tonight. It's because you outgrew that building. You outgrew the building. You know, everywhere I go since I announced I was running for the United States Senate, there is a Democrat tracker in the room. It's happening again tonight. Somebody there with the video always shooting, you know, trying to catch you saying something that isn't quite right or something that could be turned and tweaked and put into those little 30 second and you know, to the people who want to do that, I always say, come on in. Because, yeah, they may hear me speak, but more importantly, I think as they do that, they're getting the sense of what's happening in Indiana and what's happening in America as a whole. You know, Don said it, Connor said it, there is this sense going on right now that there is this quiet revolution building for the year 2012. You know, I was shocked when, after the credit downgrade of August, <coughs> when Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi and John Kerry were out there calling it the Tea Party downgrade, the Tea Party downgrade, as if the conservatives who were saying we need to manage our budget, not live beyond our means, as if somehow it was their fault that this credit downgrade took place. As I've been telling folks, there is a Tea Party downgrade. There is a conservative downgrade coming. It is going to come in November 12 when we downgrade the President of the United States to be just another unemployed community organizer. <laughs> I know I'm just a few minutes before you and pizza. <laughs> and I have to tell you, uh, about a month ago, I was in South Carolina speaking at the Red State Gathering. And I got there that morning, and they had the agenda printed out, and I was to speak immediately after Rick Perry announced he was running for president. <laughs> now, I'm telling you, that's not where you want to be on the itinerary. Right? Talking about the air being sucked out of the room. I have that same feeling today as I'm here in front of pizza for you guys. It's not the place to be. So I am going to be really, really brief and to the point. I get asked a great deal since I announced I was going to run for the United States Senate. You know, Richard, you're running against a 35-year incumbent, Dick Luger. How can you do that? He's Mr. Republican in this state. He has been for decades. And that's true. And I will tell you, I voted for Dick Luger in 1976. I know that's ancient history for all of you. I voted for him in 1976. I voted for him for many times since. But you know, I don't see the same Dick Luger that I voted for so many years ago. I announced on February 22nd that I was going to get into this race, and I really expected many times as I traveled the state, I'd have hardcore Republicans come up to me and take their finger with about the first knuckle and put it right in my sternum and say, how dare you run against Dick Luke? Except 
since February 22nd, it has happened twice. And one of the times it happened, a guy had a drink in his hand, and I think it was about his fourth drink of the evening. <laughs> you know, there is a sense around this state that it is time. We all admire Senator Luger. He is an honorable man. He is a good man. I will never say anything personally about Dick Luger whatsoever. He is absolutely, unquestionably a person of integrity. But we have great differences on the issues of conservatism. You know, as Republicans, we always say we believe in competition in the marketplace, right? Competition makes businesses better. It brings better products to market, makes companies better, makes individuals better. Competition's a good thing. Well, if competition is a good thing in the commercial marketplace, it is equally a good thing in the marketplace of conservative ideas. And that's what this campaign is going to be about. I don't believe it is the federal government's role to pick and choose winners and losers. And yet that's what it's become in every issue from which auto companies survive to how health care is rolled out. That is the government's role. Government is there, the federal government, to make sure we have equal protection under the law, not that there are winners and losers. Now those are the real nuts and bolts right there is the basis of my disagreements with Senator Luger, and I won't go into all of them tonight, but that's where it starts. I said my campaign started on February 22nd. We have made tremendous momentum. One poll shows us leading by a couple points. Amazingly, Republicans were polled, 550 Republicans were polled, not by us, by the way, but by an independent organization. And 550 Republican voters were read this statement and then asked if they agreed or disagreed. And the statement was, I believe Senator Dick Luger's had a long, distinguished career, but I believe it is time for someone else. 69% of Republicans answered yes. 69%. That's amazing. I'll tell you, for a politician, that's like the Ebola virus. You get it, you don't get over it. <laughs> but here's the thing. My name isn't simply somebody else. I am a person who spent 31 years in the business world. My state treasurer in the last five years is the only time in my life I've ever had a full-time government job. I'm a private sector person. And by the way, Thunder, or, uh, Justin's comment about my degree, and yeah, it's true. It is true. My graduate dissertation was in the field of invertebrate paleontology. I get asked a lot, what's that have to do with politics? Not much. I mentioned that not long ago. Someone came up after the speech and said, well, you're going to do incredibly well in Washington, D.C. You're used to working in a world filled with spineless creatures. <laughs> Chairman Steve Hogan will remember this well. In 1984, in this congressional district, there was a young man running for Congress against a congressional incumbent by the name of Frank McCloskey. On election night, it looked like the young Republican had won by 600 votes in a congressional race. There was a recount. He won by 400 votes, and he was declared the winner and certified by the Secretary of State of Indiana. He went to Washington, D.C. to raise his hand to be sworn in, and the Democrats, who then controlled the House, said, we don't like the way they count votes in Indiana. We're going to count them ourselves. And they have the right to do that. They sent in a five-member team, and they started counting the votes in the 15 counties of the 8th District. They went into Lawrence County, that was a solid Republican county, and they were all the little cardboard punch card ballots. And the ballot would have a little fold in it, and they'd say, this is a mutilated ballot, and they'd throw it away. Wouldn't count it. They went into Gibson County, a solid Democrat county. The ballots rolled up in a ball. And they'd say, but the intent of the voter was to have this vote counted. And they counted it. They continued counting like that until June of 1985. And late in June, 
in Posey County, the first <coughs> southwestern county of all of Indiana, they concluded their votes, and for the first time, out of 232,286 votes, the Democrat went ahead by four and was immediately declared the winner. Democrat politics, the machine work. Well, the people in the Indiana State House didn't like that, and that was controlled by Republicans. They passed the law, simple as it was, and said, you know, from now on, whatever the standard is for counting votes in a part of a geopolitical district must be applied uniformly across the entire district. You can't do it one way in Lawrence County and a different way in Posey. Who cares? Doesn't matter. A simple little law. Almost a technical correction. Until 2000. Until 2000. Bush versus Gore. Goes to the United States Supreme Court. There is no such thing as federal election law because elections are run by the states. And so the Supreme Court did what it always does in such a situation. It starts to look through all the state laws and see if we can find one that it can apply in that situation. And guess what law they found? Indiana's law. They said, you know, as we look at Florida, Whatever the standard is for counting votes in a part of the geopolitical district must be applied uniformly across the entire district. So, Mr. Gore, if you want to recount all of Florida, you can do that. But you can't just handpick a couple counties in the southern part of the heavy Democrat part of the state and recount votes. And at that, Al Gore dropped his lawsuit. And George W. Bush became president of the United States. The history of the world changed because Republicans in the State House of Indianapolis were able to make things right. I ask you to get involved, not to do it for me, not to do it simply for a candidate, but do it for yourself. Help change history. You know, historians will tell you when they track the very, very most primary meeting that led to the American Revolution, it was in the back room of a bar in Boston in uh, February of 1773 when Sam Adams and Thomas Paine and Paul Richard <coughs> and two other guys got together for drinks. I love that. <laughs> Five people in the back room of a bar led to the American Revolution, the shot heard around the world, and the greatest nation that's ever been on the world. There's what? I'm going to guess uh, 180, 200 people here tonight. You can change the world. You really can. <coughs> get involved. Keep coming back. Keep coming back. Help Ed and Casey get elected. Get involved. Change Bloomington first. Change the city. <coughs> help the congressional candidates. And yes, help my race if you can next year. By the way, Hillary White Lady here is my campus coordinator. Pat Hastings in the back row is my county coordinator. We've got those folks. I mean, we're covering this state like you can't believe. This is going to be an exciting time. Hillary, thank you for doing that. We are fired up because I come into these rooms and I always leave with more energy than I came in. It's going to be a great year for you on campus. Let's make sure we start changing the Republican city council here, and then let's really do the job next year.